This God, he, Constantine, began to invoke in prayer, beseeching and imploring him to show him who he was and to stretch out his right hand to assist him in his plans. As he made these prayers and earnest supplications, there appeared to the emperor a most remarkable divine sign. If someone else had reported it, it would perhaps not be easy to accept. But since the victorious emperor himself told the story to the present writer a long while after, when I was privileged with his acquaintance and company, and confirmed it with oaths, who could hesitate to believe the account, especially when the time which followed provided evidence for the truth of what he said? About the time of the midday sun, when day was just turning, he said he saw with his own eyes up in the sky and resting over the sun a cross-shaped trophy formed from light and a text attached to it which said, By this, conquer. Amazement at the spectacle seized both him and the whole company of soldiers which was then accompanying him on a campaign he was conducting somewhere and witnessed the miracle. He was, he said, wondering to himself what the manifestation might mean. Then while he meditated, and thought long and hard, night overtook him. Thereupon, as he slept, the Christ of God appeared to him with the sign which had appeared in the sky, and urged him to make himself a copy of the sign which had appeared in the sky, and to use this as protection against the attacks of the enemy. When day came, he arose and recounted the mysterious communication to his friends. Then he summoned goldsmiths and jewelers, sat down among them, and explained the shape of the sign, and gave them instructions about copying it in gold and precious stones. Eusebius of Caesarea, The Life of Constantine, Book 1, Chapters 28 and 29, as translated by Averill Cameron and Stuart G. Hall. Welcome to Christian Spirituality, Chapters in the History of the Faith. I am your host. Dr. Matthew Hoskin, Professor of Christian History at Davenant Hall. And in this podcast, we explore in vaguely chronological order the history of the spirituality of the Christian faith, not just the sort of big ecclesiastical events and not just the theology, um, but that which we think of as spirituality. All the three of these, of course, do impinge upon one another. And the spirituality of canon law, for example, could be a fun episode to do at some point. I just have to think more about that idea. But this week, I'm not moving in a strictly chronological mode, as you may have noticed, because last episode was about, what was last episode about? Irenaeus and the Gnostics. So we're reading around the year 200, and now I'm jumping us ahead to the 300s, to the Emperor Constantine, and what Eusebius has to tell us about him, perhaps, and what we should be thinking about when we think about Constantine, and that which we term spirituality, and all these sorts of questions and the big fourth century, which is a big deal in terms of ecclesiastical stuff, in terms of canon law, in terms of theology, in terms of all of that. So, but why, why am I doing Constantine at this juncture? Why am I jumping a century or more into the future? And the answer is shameless self-promotion. Take a sup sip of tea. That's right. Coming up, in January, I will be teaching a course called Constantine and the Conversion of the Roman Empire through Davin and Hall. And so I thought, hey, I have complete control over what I do on my own podcast. Why not take some time to uh, regale you with the wonders and the stories about Constantine, or at least plug my course. That course is going to be a 10-week offering, two, two hours per week. An hour of that will be you listening to me talk, but you're paying money this time. And I'm going to go into way more detail than I do about most of the things I do here. And then there, an hour of that time, we'll be discussing a text, a primary source. I assign ancient sources themselves. So you'll get to sit down and read the ancients for themselves in the words of the late Elaine Fantham, the classical philologist. There is nothing better than reading the ancients for themselves. And so you will get to read things like Eusebius's Life of Constantine, as well as Lactantius is on the deaths of the persecutors, as well as some bits and bobs of Roman law, everyone's favorite, and all these sorts of other wondrous and exciting things. And it's going to the course is going to cover Constantine mostly, 
So like over half the course is Constantine. But then we're going to also look at sort of the, the what flows downstream of him in terms of the relationship between church and empire. We're going to look at his sons. What is the immediate legacy of Constantine? What is their religious policy? Then we're going to look at the successor of their sons, Julian, the Emperor Julian, so-called apostate, because he, although sort of from a from what already a Christian family, um, turns away from the Christian faith and seeks to restore paganism. And then after Julian, we're going to look at Ambrose of Milan and Symmachus, this sort of question of there's an altar to victory in the Senate House in Rome, and they sort of it gets removed, and then Symmachus is part of the party in the city of Rome who wants it restored, and Ambrose. Bishop of Milan doesn't want it back. And so there's um, a number of letters that they write to the Emperor Gratian. And then finally, we can look at the Emperor Theodos. He's the first who in the modern world, in our sort of happy-go-lucky pluralist age, um, is this terrible monster who clamped down on freedom of religion, um, which is interesting because there never was freedom of religion in the Roman Empire at any point in its history. So we're going to look at him and see what his laws about Christian orthodoxy, heresy, and paganism are actually about, as well as the events of his reign and sort of what one might call the last pagans of Rome. But a lot of it's going to be a Constantine course because these things are because of the conversion of the emperor Constantine. And so we're going to use some time, spend some time in Eusebius and all these guys, as I say. Um, so I'm in the middle of crafting this course and I'm really excited about teaching it and I really hope that I can draw some listeners to come and tell all your friends, spread this abroad, spread the news. I will put the link for you to register um, in the show notes. And I want to say one thing about today's episode or chapter and about that course. I am not here to defend Constantine. I'm not here to cast shade on Constantine. Constantine is not the great hero of the church and saint that some claim him to be, like Eusebius. He is not the great villain that others, Christian and otherwise, tend to see him. He is an interesting historical figure who has a major impact upon the life of the Christian church and therefore worth studying. And of course, I also do believe that history can teach us things. I don't think that we uh, necessarily, by studying history, avoid making their mistakes. Yeah, right. Like, did the South African War end up stopping World War I? No. Nevertheless, or did World War I stop World War II? No. Nevertheless, knowing a bit about history can hopefully inform us to make wiser decisions than we would otherwise make, even if we fail at making wiser decisions than the people who came before us did, if that makes any sense. So that's just my quick plug for Constantine. But of course, this whole episode at a certain level is a plug for that course. As I talk about this emperor who was ruler of the Roman Empire. He was emperor from the year 306 till his death in the year 337. It's 31 years. Now, when he starts off, he is not sole emperor, and he is not even completely hailed and regarded by absolutely everyone as being emperor. But um, he's in a city called York. You may have heard of it. It has a beautiful cathedral in it today with a statue of Constantine in front of it at the time of his father's death. And uh, his father... There's no reason to doubt that his father names him emperor on his deathbed. Now, that is contrary to perhaps what the Emperor Diocletian wishes. But pretty much every emperor with a son had his son try to make his son his heir in the whole history of the Roman Empire. Right? It doesn't matter if we're thinking, you know, Marcus Aurelius or, you know, Augustus has adopted son Tiberius or anyone like that. You, you do actually try to get your son to be emperor upon your death and he's so he is um so that's a normal thing even if there's not necessarily a formalized constitution about it anyway so from 306 to 312 he is engaged in a series of civil wars against other guys who are like yo bro i'm emperor and he says no nah, you ain't um and that's all very fascinating we're going to gloss over it because we're doing ecclesiastical history i love late roman history i really could go on but i promise you i won't necessarily so anyway, so all these things. And then, of course, in 312, he takes the city of Rome and is essentially master of the western portion of the Roman Empire. He takes it at a battle of the Milvian Bridge. I've been to the Milvian Bridge. It's a good time. There's a oh, nice gelato place just sort of if you cross, um, if you cross the bridge from Rome 
onto the sort of the suburb on the other side, you can go get really nice gelato there. So there was no gelato at the Milvian Bridge when Constantine was. There was just death. And according to the stories as told by people like Eusebius, Eusebius actually muddies the truth a bit here. But according to the story, as most people hear it, there is this vision of Constantine and then a dream and then a painting things on shields. And then because of the painting of the things on shields and the trusting in the Christian God, the defeat of Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge. Now, there is a defeat of Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge and there is a painting of symbols on shields as to how these relate to visions and dreams. I'm not saying people don't have visions and dreams. And I'm not saying Constantine never had a vision or a dream, but it's interesting that around the year 310, before he had thrown his lot in with the Christian God, Constantine seems also to have had a vision of the God, Apollo. So put that in your pipe and smoke it and try to figure out what's going on, not with Constantine himself, but with the propagandists. And what is the truth of Constantine's visions and dreams? How do they relate to his activities as emperor and his own religious beliefs? Good question. Good question. So, but he wins. The bridge actually collapses. The Milvian Bridge collapses. So the bridge you'll walk on today, although a very old bridge is not constant, it's not the one that Constantine won a battle at. It's in the location of the one that Constantine won a battle at. It's like the ship of Theseus, but a bridge. And so Constantine becomes sole ruler of the Western Roman Empire. And he throws in his lot with the Christian God. This is what I, how I like to phrase it. Um, I personally think it should be completely non-controversial to say that Constantine, from this point onwards, is a Christian. Now, does that mean he has a perfect understanding of what this means in terms of ethics? And what this means in terms of theology? What this means in terms of canon law? No. Why should it? Doesn't mean he's not sincere. Doesn't mean he's not a person who actually believes that the Christian God is the one true and living God. So from here on, his policies from here on favor the Christian religion over the traditional religions and other pagan polytheistic or whatever, solar monotheism. Any takers? Platonism. All of these things. He favors Christianity over that. And he is using, and he uses imperial funds to do things like build church buildings, um, to restore property to Christians that they lost during the persecution of his predecessor, Diocletian. So he is promoting Christianity, and he even bans pagan sacrifice, which is a controversial thing to say, but I think Tim Barnes makes a good case that this is something that happens. So he is clearly acting like a Roman emperor, but like a Roman emperor who believes that Christianity is the true religion, even if he doesn't understand, even if he's not a theologian, he's no Justinian or something, right? Um, although in some ways he is a Justinian because he tries to impose religious uniformity upon the empire, which is one of his other big effects, right? So we have his conversion, we have the toleration edict of 313, the so-called edict of Milan, where he and his colleague Licinius in the East grant freedom of religion and freedom of worship to the persons in the empire. And then there's, but they end up having another civil war, 316, 17, and then again in 324. From 324 onwards, Constantine's got the whole empire in his hands. He's got the whole empire in his hands. He's got the wee bitty baby in his hands. No. So, and this means that he can bring about his own vision of a unified empire with a unified religion. And one of the problems, there are lots of problems that therefore Constantine meets. And I probably shouldn't get into all of them because I want to start talking more about spirituality, right? But I want to say a few things then about what Constantine does and does not do in terms of the spiritual life of the church. So for example, you may have heard, you have heard it said that Christians before Constantine were all meeting in somebody's living room. I say to you, not only in their living rooms, but in purpose-built church buildings. Um... Constantine does not, the the emergence of the church building, although Constantine funds the building of churches, places like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Church of the Holy Nativity and, you know, the church, all the, lots of them. Um, 
there were church buildings beforehand. We have a variety of different pieces of evidence for that um, archaeological and textual from the third century onwards. And also the living rooms that people were meeting in. I don't know if you have really spent a lot of time thinking about that. It wasn't like my living room where you can maybe fit five people. We're talking like an atrium of a moderately wealthy, well-off person or the big workshop of a tradesman who is taking Sunday off as his Sabbath as a Christian. And therefore he's, the space is available. And so you can come in and it's a big open space to gather. And it is not a cozy sitting on couches or reclining and at a triclinium because they're Romans. So you've got that going on and you've got churches. So that's one thing. Yes. There's like a big spate of building new churches, either rebuilding ones that got destroyed, like the one in Nicomedia, which was right across from the palace of Diocletian. That one gets rebuilt, right? After it gets destroyed by Diocletian, right? So you're rebuilding churches or building new churches like Sepul the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that I mentioned before. Um, there's a big one, Saint Agnese in Rome, that also gets built. So we have this going on, and that's actually a pretty cool thing. As I say... Church buildings, church property, spaces where people can gather together in large numbers are thus not a Constantinian development. I'm not going to go through all of the other things that are not developments that sometimes get thrown at him, like, say, canon law, church councils, bishops and their authority, the canon of scripture, liturgical worship. These things all predate Constantine by quite a bit. And councils of bishops, for example, have been meeting prior to Constantine, and have been perceived as having a binding authority from one bishop unto another. So I'm not going to get into all those. But just think about church buildings, actually. This is kind of an interesting thing to think about. We know from some of the archaeological evidence, such as Dioropos, that Christians were putting frescoes, um, which are paintings painted right into plaster, on the interiors of certain of their buildings, illustrating um, Bible stories and things relevant to the Christian faith prior to Constantine. So we know that these sorts of things are going on. But what? So what is the change with Constantine and the imperial money now flowing forth for churches? And not just imperial money, though, but other money, too. Aristocrats are becoming Christians. Um, you can actually chart. There's all sorts of statistics that Tim Barnes has put together in one of his articles where you can trace the conversion of aristocrats to Christianity in Rome throughout the course of the fourth century. So that's a really interesting thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you've got lots of money coming at the church for things like the building of buildings. And what you end up getting are, you know, huge things like the Basilica of Sant'Agnese Fuori le Mura, which you, if you go, you can see the remains of what was this huge 4th century basilica and a small, lovely, delicate 7th century basilica just down the hill from it of Santa Niese for Le Mura. Um, today, you can see that. You can go to the church of Santa Pudenziana and see some, a 4th century mosaic of Christ, very classical style image. I actually thought it was Renaissance when I looked at it because it's so different from a lot of other late antique mosaic work. Um, but of Christ teaching, sitting, and teaching like a like a teacher in a philosophical school, even, in fact, which would make sense given the context of the making of the image, um, a mosaic on the apse in the basilica. So we have all these spaces being created, and the form of architecture that the Constantinian world sort of adopts to be the one for Christian churches is the basilica. And the basilica is not a temple. A basilica is a secular building um, used for gathering together to do business or have whatever sorts of large assemblies you might be allowed to have or whatever. And the business of a basilica happens inside and anyone is welcome. This is different from a pagan temple where the business of the temple actually happens. Uh, the business, the sacrifice happens in front of the temple um, on the altar there. And inside there is the statue of the god. And that is it. But the main worship of pagan gods actually occurs in front of temples and that's the main public space is the exterior which is why you are more likely to find a pagan roman temple with um relief carvings on the outside of it such as the arapacus or something like that um whereas a lot of christian churches you go into them thinking fourth century churches they're gonna have frescoes and mosaics on the inside facing inward towards the congregation and so 
I, there, there are things I'm not wanting to judge here as to whether things get better or worse in this particular sphere. What it means is that with the conversion of Constantine and the promotion of building these buildings, Christians now have visible, dedicated places that they can safely go to without fear of aggression from the authorities, because the authorities are actually favoring them, paying, and at times paying for these sorts of things, and no longer fund funding the pagan temple down the street either. And you can go and you can assemble all of you together in freedom, which, I mean, they've been assembling together sort of in secret before, right? Which is why if you've studied um, all the documents of church order from before Constantine, you will know that deacons were sort of bouncers to keep the um, unkept, the those who are not interested out. There's no pagan inquirers turning up. Um, and even the catechumens who are planning to get baptized get kicked out at a certain point before the Eucharist itself actually happens. And so you're able to go, and then you've got these images start appearing in the churches um, surrounding you, sometimes images of Christ, sometimes images of Bible stories a lot of the time, um, very strongly biblical images at this sort of fourth, and a lot of the art I'm starting to, my mind is starting to drift to his fifth century, actually, um, so I try to pull it back to Constantine. And so this, of course, will have an impact upon the experience of the liturgy and um when you go to gather together because we were just looking at that a couple of chapters ago we were looking at justin and going to church in the second century so going to church in the fourth century you're turning up at this big beautiful building in public which you had done maybe your your father or your grandfather had maybe done in the late 200s going to a big building and you know all these things this is actually Eusebius actually cites the prosperity of the church in the late third century as being one of the causes of the persecution. That was God's judgment on them for becoming too worldly. So that's worth pointing out because some people say one of the ill effects of the Constantinian settlement is that the church becomes too worldly. Well, Eusebius shows that you can be too worldly without the favor of the emperor, that the temptations towards worldliness, towards ostentation, towards seeking power and authority over others in a manner that is unbefitting a cleric are always there. So, but anyway, we're able to do this totally in public and with a growing body of people who are joining you. And so this also, I think, is going to fundamentally disrupt what's happening. First of all, you get Sunday off. So you can go to church as part of your regular spiritual round without missing work, without worrying about your boss getting mad at you. In theory, I doubt that's necessarily the case all the time, right? But uh, Sunday starts to be enshrined in law. And you go to this to a beautiful building and you're surrounded by images of the saints, which one hopes could instill in you what sort of later people, when they start thinking about icons and well, at least writing about what people have been thinking about them, um, should be inspiring the churchgoer. One hopes to re remember the company of all of the faithful, that great cloud of witnesses um, that is written in the epistle to the Hebrews. And so you have these sorts of things going on at the same time. Um, and this, I think, is going to affect the spirituality of the daily life of the Christian worshiper. But also, at the same time, you do have these aristocrats I mentioned, right? Um, this is one of the other influences upon spirituality is a great influx of people um, into the church. And whereas before, one could confidently say, if you're joining a persecuted sect in a world where there is no freedom of religion, no freedom of assembly, if you're joining such a group that even has bouncers to keep out those who are not members from even observing what their worship looks like, you're definitely committed to in a real way. But the unanswerable question about from the fourth century onwards is how many of these guys, whether they're an uneducated slave who's coming along because of his master or an aristocrat who's coming along because of the emperor, how many of this new influx of people getting baptized is properly catechized? How many of them actually know? And sometimes, this is not the sole reason for the group of people we call the Desert Fathers, who I love and would love to talk about and actually will be coming out on a different podcast you will be able to hear me talk about them, and I'll plug Brian's podcast with me talking in my podcast so you can go find it when that episode drops. But you have um, people coming out who are maybe not as 
all in the sorts of people who, if there ever were persecution again, would be traditories, people who would burn the incense, people who would hand over the scriptures, but becoming Christians and filling up the basilica. So what does this do? It creates perhaps a movement of rigorists who always are there, some of whom go off and become ascetics and sort of there. So there's a mixture of motives, good and bad in that sort of separation. Um, going into the desert and becoming desert fathers, both as an icon to the community to, hey, you can do better. Seek holiness and purity and cut yourself off from the world, even if you are an aristocrat, right? And some of the aristocrats themselves become desert fathers like Abba Arsenios, who was a senator, um, like a senatorial rank, senatorial class. And so you have this going on. Um, and I actually, I think that one of the, if, the impacts of the Constantinian settlement is in fact the formalization and structure of asceticism into what we in our sort of contemporary language would think of as monasticism. I believe that monasticism in terms of monomaniacal focus on God and being monotropous, being single-minded in one's devotion to God is a thing that is as old as Christianity, that people who are ascetics in terms of being doing lots of fasting and praying and being celibate and all these sorts of things. These people have also always existed, but it starts to formalize itself, starts to become a sort of charismatic movement at the same time as gaining, starting to also gain some institutionalism, which people might argue with me on, but I think that the things that that happen sort of at Sketis and Nitria, and most especially the Pacomian monasteries um, upstream, I think you do see there's a formalization of what is going on there. And I think that's worth meditating upon as an aspect of this, especially if you love monasticism um, and you see it as being an important thing. Um, so I think that aspect of late antiquity is partly a response to the Constantinian settlement, partly because once again, of the very public nature that Christianity now holds, there is both room for sort of visible, we might say, internal brotherly protest, right? Which is one form of it, as well as being able to go out and say, hey, we can build a monastery here in the desert. We can go to this abandoned village and take it over with all our monks because we have so many of them. And you're not actually worried that some sort of imperial commissioner is going to come along and say, no way, Jose, this is not, this is not what you're allowed to do. So I think that that is a Perhaps not one of the things when people think about the impact of Constantine on spirituality. I don't think they actually think of the rise of the monastic movement. They probably think more of these aristocrats and a, and a, what's the word? A weakening, uh, making the faith um, thinner, a diluting. There we go. A diluting of the faith. But I think there are lots of things going on at the same time that are that mean that the conversion of the emperor and his financing of the church setting clerics free from taxation, building church properties, um, creating incentives for people to convert to Christianity. These things are having a variety of different kinds of impacts upon the spirituality of the Christian church. To take another one, to think back, I think three weeks, three episodes, not weeks, because I skipped a bunch of weeks, but three, ep three episodes or chapters back, we talk about the Bible in the second century and how one of the things to talk about is that, well, that canon of scripture is basically informally speaking closed. And one of the things that Constantine does is commission Bibles um, that all of the major churches are supposed to get their hands on what one calls a pandect. A pandect is a, is a one volume Bible, which we're like, yeah, so what? Like everyone has a one volume Bible. I have like 20, right? Well, in the ancient world, you tend to just have like a book, say, of the epistles of St. Paul or an uh, even, even, evangeliary, right? Book of the Gospels or a book of the Psalms or a book of, you know, Torah, the Pentateuch and all these, or the Octatuch, right? The first eight books. Like these are, these are the things that tend to be what people have. And you have a whole set of them um, because it's expensive to make books. But nevertheless, here we go. We've got these codices that survive from the fourth century, from the era of Constantine. Christians are able to get their hands on Bibles, right? Um, and this is a thing. The Bible has always been at the center of Christian spirituality, at the center of Christian theology, at the center of Christian canon law and church order. At some level, tradition is out there flowing along with it. 
but it's there. It's not as though it was discovered by Martin Luther or first ever printed by Gutenberg. Well, yes, first ever printed by Gutenberg because he's the first guy with the press. But the Bible is there in the ancient world and bishops want it. Christians want to be able to have it read to them. Those with money want to have their own copy to read for themselves, probably. And so Constantine makes this a possibility, um, once again, with his imperial funding. And that I'm not supposed to be passing judgment as to whether that's a good or bad thing. But it's hard to see it bad. So it's just another way in which imperial backing um, can have an influence upon the spirituality, the spiritual lives of praying Christians who are trying to lead ethical lives and follow in the path of Jesus Christ, they're getting their hands or they're getting access to Bibles as a result of this. They're able to go to church and gather freely without fear. That sounds like, um, so th these are things that are going on. Um, these are various ways in which that Constantine is impacting Christian spirituality. One of the other things, because of these things is Constantine calls the first ever council that is, it is considered from like a holy council of bishops, the Council of Nicaea called in 325 to deal with the Arian crisis, as well as a schism in Egypt called the Miletian schism, as well as what to do with the date of Easter. But it is considered as what we would in technical terms call an ecumenical council from fairly early on. And one of the comments that you will see people make, such as St. Isidore of Seville in the 600s, is that, hey, this was the first time because of the peace of the church that Constantine had granted, beginning with his conversion in 312, this was the first time Christians were able to get together and from all these bishops come together safely. They're given safe passage on all the roads and they can get together and talk about things and hash it out. It's not the first ever council, but it's the first one that tries to draw everybody from the whole inhabited world, the Oikumene. And it brings people from Spain. It brings people from Persia. Mostly it brings people from like the Levant, Eastern Mediterranean region, but it brings these people together. Um, and it sort of sets this precedent for synodal fellowship amongst the bishops, which in theory is actually a beautiful thing that you is hard to do when you are undergoing persecution. Um, but of course, doesn't always work out. People don't always actually agree. And, uh, not everyone actually agrees as to how many of these councils were to happen, but that's another thing that Constantine needs that's rolling is this series of councils that are considered to be sort of having universal binding jurisdiction in both canon law and theology is um, another thing. And that impinges upon spirituality because Constantine, shocker, I think a lot of people think that Constantine has something at stake in this, that this has something to do with Gnosticism. Absolutely not. Take my course. One of the things that Constantine is into is unity. And he honestly, I don't think he cares. Um, he thinks, in fact, that the whole question about whether the son is consubstantial with the father or, you know, there was when he was not or the eternality of the son or whatever. What does divine begetting look like? Constantine doesn't care. Couldn't give a doesn't doesn't does not give a hoot. However, Whatever the bishops decide on, Constantine's going to agree to. And that's, in fact, what he does. And so then this is a thing that I think, I hope that everyone can see this as an ambivalent reality moving forward for the church, this relationship with the emperor, that he enforces orthodoxy, that the bishops can decide what orthodoxy is, but then the emperor uses the coercive force of government to make everyone agree to orthodoxy. Or uses the coercive force of government, even on orthodox people who've agreed to orthodoxy, but who just don't do what the emperor says. People like Athanasius um, gets himself exiled by Constantine, in fact, not to mention Constantine's son. So this is, I think, an ambivalent thing. The ability of the emperor to promote orthodoxy, it seems good if you're on the orthodox side. If you're not, and you would, of course, if you're not orthodox, you still think you're orthodox. That's kind of how humans are you all no one sits around thinking i know i'm wrong but screw you that's not actually the way people go about with their religious beliefs they think that they're right so everyone thinks that everyone thinks himself orthodox basically but this i think anyway th now this may sound like we're, oh, we're getting to the big ecclesiastical history how does this impinge upon spirituality well it impinges upon the bishops and one of the chief roles of bishops 
is that they're the guy, say, at when you're going to church in the second century or fourth century, he's the guy who's presiding at the Eucharist, and he's the guy who's doing the teaching. He has the teaching office, right? This is the whole apostolic succession thing from Irenaeus. This is what you're, you know, but Irenaeus is so up against heresies that you need to have people who are new, giving sound doctrine. It's good for the spiritual health of people to believe true things. Well, now the emperor is able to modify, to intervene in the life of the church, in the appointment and removal of bishops in some way. I'm not saying he's not. We're not talking like Caesar or papism or something. But it's, you know, we're on the way there, we could say. Um, and so then that is ambivalent in its influences. Now, one may say Matthew as an Anglican. You should be saying that this is a great, wonderful thing, what with the act of supremacy and all. And I will maintain my ambivalence on this point until the day I die. And of course, all of my friends who are more Anabaptist than I am will tell you it's a net negative, of course. Um, I think that ecclesiastical history is far messier than that. And I hope that this weird little video um, has helped show you that. And so if you like what you heard here today, tell your friends. Click like button. Give me five stars wherever you are. Make some comments. Let me know what you think. Um, but don't make comments about Constantine not being a Christian because that means you don't know what you're talking about. So there. Which means that's exactly the kind of comment I'm going to get on YouTube. I guarantee it. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to next week's episode where we explore a topic as yet to be determined, but no doubt something delightful. Thank you very much.